If you're new to Power Query, or even if you've used Power Query for some time, one of the more intimidating aspects of Power Query occurs when you go to Get Data and utilize the From File, From Folder Connector. So we browse out to a location, hit Open, and this brings in the metadata of that folder. Now I'm going to perform some perfunctory steps to clean up. The data that I wish to extract is stored in these binary files within the content column. Now Power Query has a wonderful feature that will do all the extraction for you if you just go up and click this button here, the Combine Files button. So I'll give it a click. And within just a few moments, I have fully extracted data all stacked up into a single table. To achieve this, Power Query had to create an entire series of helper queries that you can see here over on the left side of the screen. So if we look at the Applied Steps list, we connect it to the source, I standardized the casing on my extensions, I did a bit of filtering, and then everything from this point down was done for me. Now that is very convenient, however now I have to deal with all this extra overhead in terms of the queries list. For beginners and a lot of veterans, the helper queries that were created here are just a giant mystery. Now these all serve a purpose, and they're worth learning at some point, but there is a way to avoid creating all of these helper queries and still achieving the goal. So let's see how to avoid creating all these extra queries in Power Query. Along this journey, we're going to look at some really interesting optimization tricks to help you shorten the number of steps in your query and to do things that you can't do through the point and click interface. We'll look at how to control the search limit for the from folder connector, why it's important to standardize your text casing. We'll see how to filter by path and by extension, how to filter within nested tables, this is so we can filter before the extraction of the data. And finally, how to perform column reordering and renaming during a table extraction. Let's start with avoiding the helper queries when working with nested CSV files. I've got a folder here with a lot of different files and some of them are CSV, but there's a subfolder here called CSV files. And in this folder, I have subfolders. Each subfolder contains a CSV file for each month of a year. If we look at one of these files as a sample, it's just simple transactional information. Four columns, a header row, a little over 2,000 rows, and a grand total at the bottom. So each file is the same structure, just different data. So I want to extract all of the files in all the subfolders below the CSV files folder location. I don't want any of the CSV files in this folder, and I don't want any of the Excel files in the other subfolder. We'll begin by pulling all of the CSV files from a folder location. We'll go to Data, Get Data, From File, From Folder. I'll browse to where the files are located, hit Open. This displays all the metadata of the files within the folder location. This is not a complete list, but it's enough to let me know I'm in the right place. I'm going to choose Transform Data, and this brings that metadata into the Power Query Editor. Now before we go any further, notice in the formula bar that we're using the folder.files connector which has discovered 55 rows worth of data. Now this is every folder, subfolder, and file within the initial folder start location. Suppose you only wanted files within the start location and not any of the subfolders. If we go up to the formula bar, we can change this from a folder.files connector to a folder.contents connector. And when I hit check, now we're down to 16 files because this will only show the files within the parent folder and the subfolders. So if there's no extension, either the file has no extension or it's a subfolder. So if you only wanted files from this location, you could go to the extension and filter out the blanks, blanks being the subfolders. And now you've limited your scope of discovery to just the parent folder. Now I'm going to delete that filter step and I actually want files within the subfolders. So I'm gonna go back and change this from folder.contents to folder.files. And so now we're back to the initial 55 files that were discovered. I want to only pull in CSV files so I'll go to the extension column and do some filtering. But notice there are multiple versions of the casing for CSVs. I could go in here and select each of those versions, but it's possible that in the future a user might store a CSV file with an extension casing that I did not predict and that would break my query. Since Power Query is case sensitive, a better way to deal with this, cancel, is to standardize the casing of the extension column. And you can do this by right clicking on the heading and go to transform and I'm going to choose uppercase. You could choose lowercase or capitalize each word. It's a personal preference. I'm going with uppercase. And with the casing standardized, 
Now when I go to my filter, I only have one CSV to choose from. Hit OK, and I'm only looking at CSV files. The next thing I want to do is ensure I'm only getting CSV files within a certain subfolder. If we scroll over in the metadata, there is a column called Folder Path. Now it's a little hard to see the full path, so I'm going to take Folder Path and grab the header and move that column over. And this is so I can expand the width of that column in a way I would normally do like in Excel. There are CSV files in other folders, and I don't want those, just the ones in the folder called CSV files. So we'll use this folder path column to go up and do a text filter. And I'm going to use a text filter that contains backslash CSV files, backslash. So if it's got CSV files in the folder path, I want to keep it. The only column I really need to keep is the content column, because those are the binary files that actually hold my data. So I'm going to right click the heading and remove all the other columns. Now it is right here where the scary things begin. I'm going to click the Combine Files button. And after a few moments, all of the data in all of those binary files have been extracted and appended into a single table. As you can see on the left, there are a series of helper queries that were created. These are what are performing all of the work. If we look at our applied steps list, we connect it to the source, we uppercase the file extensions, we filtered by CSV. I moved the path column over just so I could see it a little bit easier, but I can actually delete that step. We filtered to only pull files from the CSV files folder. We removed all the other columns except content. And now all of the steps after this are what were performed by clicking that one combine files button. Going back to the last step, which is the change type step. A nice thing about that combine files action is that when all of the tables are stacked together into a single table, all of the headers are stripped out of each of the files except for the very first file. If you remember, at the end of each of those CSV files was a grand total row. So although the helper queries did not bring in redundant headers, they're not going to remove these grand total rows from the data. When the trend date column was converted to a date data type, every one of those rows that said grand total would have rendered into an error. And I can see that by going up to keep rows, keep errors. So we see here there are 29 error rows. When I click next to one of the errors, it reveals that that particular row was a grand total row. And when the words grand total were rendered into a date data type, they were turned into errors. I'm going to remove that kept errors step, and we need to get rid of those 29 errors. So I'll right click the heading and choose remove errors. So all the grand total rows have been pulled out. Now let's see a different way to get to this same point but without all of these helper queries. Now we're going to assume a little more responsibility, but it's not very much, and it does avoid having to have all this extra overhead. Now I've gone back in time just to the point where we were about to hit the Combine Files button. This time, instead of clicking the Combine Files button, we're going to go up to Add Column, Custom Column, and we'll call this new column CSV Data. The function we're going to use is to take a CSV file dot document, open parentheses, and it is this content column that we wish to iterate through extracting the data from these various CSV files. So I'll double click the word content over here on the right, close parentheses. So CSV dot document, and the only variable is to point to the column that holds the binary files. Hit OK. That will create a series of nested tables. And if we click next to the word table, we can peek into the file and we can see that there's a header row and then we have the four columns of data. Now that I've extracted the tables from the binary files, I no longer need the content column. So I'll hit delete and throw that out. Now the combine files button has been replaced with the expand tables button. And when we peeked into that file, we want every column from each of these nested tables. So I'll go to expand table, leave all of these checked, hit okay. I have just extracted the data from every one of those CSV files and stacked it into a single table, just like those helper functions did. But if we go expand the navigation pane, notice there are no helper queries. Now I said we were going to have to assume a little bit of this responsibility, such as going up to home and using the first row as the header. The system has set the data types for us. Now remember, there are 29 total rows because there were 29 files and those need to be pulled out. And we can see those errors if we go to the trend date column and do what we did before, keep rows, keep errors but now there are 57 rows worth of errors. If we click next to the word error here on row one, this was an error of the words grand total being turned into a date data type. But if we click next to the error on row two, this is the redundant header for the next month's file. So for each of these, we're going to have a header row that needs to be pulled out, 
and a grand total row that needs to be pulled out. So we have 29 grand total rows and 28 redundant headers to remove. All of those grand total rows and redundant headers have been rendered into errors because of the data typing of the Trandate column. So I'm going to delete the kept errors step, and all I have to do is go to Trandate, right-click, remove the errors. We are now in the exact same position that we were before when we had pressed the Combine Files button. There are a few extra steps here that we had to perform, but those were very lightweight steps, and it kept us from having to create all of those supporting queries. We'll rename this query to CSV Data. Now we'll go up and click Close and Load and send this back to Excel as a proper table. Now let's see how we can do this with Excel files. In this parent folder, I have a subfolder called Excel files, and if I go into it, I can see a series of Excel files, and each of these files is just sales information for a particular state. If we examine the contents of one of these files, each file has a table with four columns. So for the Florida sales, these are the transactions for Florida. Now the problem is, if I combine all the transactions of all the files into a single table, I'll lose focus of which transactions came from which state. So I'll need to somehow introduce a fifth column that stamps the state name at a transactional level. That way if I sort by item or quantity or amount, I don't lose state focus. So back in Excel, we're going to go up to data, get data, from file, from folder. I'll go to the parent folder, start my search here. Now remember at this point, if I wish to scan this folder and all subfolders, I'll use the folder files connector. But if I only wanted to pull files from this folder and not any of its subfolders, I would change this from folder files to folder contents. And then I could do something like filter for XLSX files. Now I don't actually want to do that. I want to find all of the files within a specific subfolder location. So I'll put this back to files. We'll do what we did before. We'll standardize the extension, uppercase. I'm going to scroll over to the path and I don't want any Excel files from the parent folder, and I don't want any Excel files from the CSV files subfolder. I only want Excel files from this Excel files subfolder location. So we'll go to Folder Path, Text Filter, Contains, and we'll search for anything that has a slash Excel files in the path. Scrolling back over, this reduces the list to just Excel files for the state sales. Since the data is stored in the binary files located within the content column, I don't need any of the other columns. So I'll right click the content column header and remove the other columns. Now this is the moment where we would click the combine files button to iterate through each of the binary files, extracting the data and stacking it up into a single table. But since I'm trying to avoid that, I'm going to go up to add column, custom column. The name of this column will be extracted data and just as before, when I used a csv.document function, this obviously isn't a CSV file, so we have to use a different function called Excel Workbook. Open parentheses, just like the CSV document function, we point to the content column because that's the column of binary files that we want to iterate through, extracting the content. Close parentheses, hit OK. And now we have a list of nested tables. This is the data that's been extracted from the binaries. If we take a peek into one of these tables, we'll see everything that Power Query discovered when it looked in that file. Power Query did discover the table of data, but it actually discovered two versions of that data. One is the data that is contained within the table, but it also discovered all the data on the sheet. So it's seeing the data on the sheet, but it's also seeing the data in a table form. This will be the case for each of these state's files because each of these files has a proper table and that proper table is on the sheet and Power Query sees it both ways. Now we want the table version because if we bring in the sheet version, the sheet version has the potential to go up to a million rows and 16,000 columns wide. So the table version will reduce the scope of analysis to just where data exists. But if we expand these tables out, we'll get the data in the table form and a duplicate of that data in the sheet form. And then we'll have double entries. So what we want to do is when we iterate through each of these binary files, we only want to bring out discovered tables, not discovered sheets. In other words, we want to filter the binary file as we perform the extraction. Now to do this, we're going to go up into the formula bar and after the each keyword, we're going to wrap the Excel workbook content function inside a table select rows function. So table select rows will take everything that was discovered by the Excel workbook function and iterate through each row of that discovered table, but only keeping rows where the kind column is equal to table. Let's expand this out so we can see the whole function. We'll get our closing parentheses. So we started with the binary file and then we did a filtered extraction into a table where it only pulled the discovered table of data, not the discovered sheet of data. And it did that for each of these state files. So we can see how it iterated through the kind column and filtered for table. Now we can delete the content column 
looking inside one of these tables, we need the column entitled data because that's what holds the transactional information. But remember, we needed to preserve the state from which that transaction came. And since the table was named after its state, that state name is located in the item column. So we want to extract the data and the item columns. We'll go to extract tables. We'll choose data and item, hit OK. When we go back to the data column and extract the transactions, I want to have that state name stamped before each transaction. Now I could add a step to reorder these columns, but instead of incurring an additional step in my query, I could go into the M code and just reverse the listing of the selected columns. So instead of it being data and item, it can be item and data. Now these are the columns I'm extracting. This duplicate set is the name I want to give those columns after the extraction. Now I could type in item and data, and when I hit check, we can see how we've done the extraction and sorted the columns at the same time. Now I'm okay with this column being called data because when we extract these tables, the header will be pulled out and replace the word data with the actual headings of these columns. But this column called item needs to be renamed to state. Now as before, you could double click and rename it to state, and that will incur an additional step in your query list. I'm going to delete that. Or you could go right into the M code and tell it that the extracted column name item needs to be displayed with this new heading state. So we're extracting the columns item and data and displaying them as state and data. Now we'll go to the data column of nested tables, expand those tables, and I want all of these columns. While we're here, we'll go ahead and do some data typing, transform, detect data type. So state is text, item number is whole number, quantity is whole number, item amount is decimal, that really could be refined to currency. But look at transaction number, it's an any data type. Now the reason it's an any data type is because Power Query scanned the column and found a mixture of numbers and words because at the bottom of each of these tables is a total row. So we need to get rid of all of these total rows from these appended tables. Now we could filter out for the word total, but what if other words creep into the mix later? To make this a little more future proof, we'll go ahead and data type the transaction number column to a whole number data type, and this will render any row with any text as an error. In fact, if we were to go up to home, keep rows, keep errors, we can see that there is a single error row for each state because each state has a total row. I'm going to get rid of that step. So we'll right click the transaction number column and remove the errors and we've just removed all of the total rows. So looking through, we now have all of the state's data stacked into a single table. Each transaction has been stamped with its respective state names. And I do notice here a state with a space in its name has been supplanted with an underscore. So I could do something like a right click, replace values, and replace all underscores with spaces. And that way, if you have something like North Carolina, South Carolina, North Dakota, South Dakota, we won't have those spaces in the names. We don't have any grand total rows. We don't have any redundant headers. And best of all, if we open up the navigation pane, we don't have any of those scary queries. I'll rename this one to Excel data. So I'll go up to close and load and send this out to Excel as a proper table. And that's how we can avoid building all of those helper queries when extracting data from CSV and Excel files. Now this video does not have a download file to accompany it with all of this data, but I do have some text files you can download, link in the video description, that has all the steps of the query laid out, so you could repeat this in your own data set. Be sure to check out other videos in our video library, because remember, at BCTI, the learning never stops.